This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. When it comes to the history of animation, you'd be hard-pressed to find an era more unique than World War II. The war itself shook humanity to its core, and almost every facet of existence was impacted, including animation. We saw a shift with cartoon characters from this time, as they went from bonking each other to bonking members of the Axis forces. The Germans, the Japanese, the Italians, none of them were safe from getting dunked on to the utmost degree. Some of the most iconic cartoon characters of all time were involved. Bugs Bunny, Popeye, Donald Duck. It was a united effort from these legendary animation studios to contribute to the Allied war effort, to raise money for war bonds, to rally the spirits of the soldiers and citizens of the Western powers, and of course, a healthy dose of cartoony destruction unleashed on Adolf and his companions. It's been over 75 years since the end of World War II. And thankfully, the world hasn't had another event of that magnitude since then. But looking back on these cartoons, one can't help but feel a certain level of discomfort from watching these animated shorts. Needless to say, they haven't aged well, and for good reason. They came from a time of total war, of utter contempt for people of different countries and ethnicities, with both sides using the media to dehumanize one another. Fortunately, times have changed, and this kind of content is from a bygone age. But that begs the question, whatever happened to these cartoons? How do studios such as Disney or Warner Brothers handle these uncomfortable reminders from their past? Do they censor them, flat out ban them, or do they ignore them and let sleeping dogs lie? Well, let's take a closer look. Does your tobacco taste different lately? So before we continue, I want to make it abundantly clear that this video is for educational purposes. There will be some prejudiced depictions of people in these animated shorts, but I personally believe that understanding our history is very important and we shouldn't turn a blind eye to our past just because it makes us uncomfortable. If anything, it's one of the best ways for us to avoid repeating past mistakes and appreciate the progress we've made since then. So consider this video a digital museum of historical animation with a sole intent to learn. All right, let's continue. Now, I've talked about World War II cartoons before on my channel, but more the propaganda nature behind their creation. They absolutely served a purpose, and that was mainly to support the Allied forces. Now, there was the occasional cartoon from the Axis powers, but they were few and far between. Animation was incredibly difficult to produce during the 1930s and 40s, and the United States was the main hub for the industry. Oh, and get this, apparently Hitler was a massive fan of Walt Disney. Goebbels even gifted Hitler some Mickey Mouse films to him for Christmas, and that both of them were psyched for the release of Snow White. But uh, yeah, they never saw it. They were busy starting a world war. The irony, considering that Disney Studios would go on to create multiple cartoons to disparage Hitler and roast him. Also, Adolf here wanted to create an animation studio to rifle Disney, but that never happened. I'll do a video about that in the future. For the US, the animation industry was put to work to help with the war effort. The advent of mainstream film was a powerful tool to raise public awareness, and the US government even paid studios, such as Disney and Warner, to create propaganda cartoons to educate soldiers and civilians, and of course, raise money for war bonds. Actually, it can be argued that Disney would have gone bankrupt if it wasn't for the US military commissioning 20 animated shorts from the studio. Fantasia was a financial disaster, so in a twisted way, World War II saved Disney. So overall, that's why you see so many iconic cartoon characters from this era beating up soldiers from the Axis powers. They were paid to. Hey folks, did the animators from these studios get creative with their artistic interpretations? Really, uh, I guess creative is one way of putting it. Again, this was war. Terrible, ugly, devastating war that one can spend multiple lifetimes researching and still not understand everything there is to it. That being said, 
This is our past. Whether you like it or not, the best thing we can do is learn from it, be better. Speaking of which, what do the studios who made these cartoons think of them today? Well, let's find out. All right, so let's check out five particular cartoons from World War II. The first one I want to discuss is, and forgive my pronunciation, Ihon Sinkya Hayakun Sanja Rokunin, aka Toy Box Series 3 Picture Book. This is a Japanese short from 1934 and technically isn't a World War II cartoon, but is more of a precursor to the war. In it, you have an evil Mickey Mouse attacking an island of Japan. He's flying on some Mickey Mouse pterodactyl and has an army of snakes that is defeated by iconic Japanese folklore characters, which I did not know that Cuphead was one of them. Look at that guy. He looks a bit like it, right? Yeah, yeah, I see it. At the end of the short, Mickey is turned into an old man and the Japanese characters laugh at him. It's interesting to see Mickey Mouse represent American imperialism, which, let's be real here, is still a common metaphor to this very day. Ironically, the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, was a big fan of Mickey and requested he be buried with his Mickey Mouse watch on. It's very rare to see propaganda cartoons from the Axis powers, so I definitely wanted to bring this one up, especially since we get to see an evil Mickey. But as far as I can tell, the studio that made the short never made anything afterwards, though IMDb says that one of the directors, Takeo Nakano, directed another movie in 2011 called Wasp Women in Tokyo. Yeah, I doubt that. <laughs> Next, there's the Fuhrer's face. I've mentioned this one before, but I would be remiss to not mention it again. Created by Disney and released in 1943, this short features Donald Duck and Nazi Germany, showcasing the horrific life of a German factory worker. The short was so popular that it even won an Academy Award. Remember how I said that part of these cartoons was to disparage the image of the Axis powers? Well, here you go. Uh, take it from me, these caricatures get much more aggressive with the next few cartoons on my list, but we'll get to those in a moment. Like I said, Donald Duck is stuck as a factory worker in Germany, where he's worked nearly to death. No breaks, no food, no freedoms. He is a slave to the state, and he hates it. At the end, he wakes up from his nightmare in his very patriotic bedroom. I mean, doesn't every American have a miniature Statue of Liberty at their windowsill? The entire purpose of this short was to demonstrate how bad the citizens of Germany have it compared to the blessings and freedoms of the American people. Now, Disney has this weird track record when it comes to addressing animated movies and shows that are now culturally dated. Uh, take Song of the South, for example. Disney won't touch that movie with a 10-foot pole. But then you have something like Peter Pan, which is up on Disney+, Plus, a movie with a very racist song about Native Americans. Now, I'm glad that Disney owned up to Peter Pan and has a disclaimer at the start of the film, admitting to their past mistakes. But they don't do this for all of their previous content. Like I said, Song of the South gets completely ghosted by Disney. Well, I guess except for the theme park ride, which is about to change, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but De Fury's face essentially gets the same treatment. You will not find this one on Disney Plus. And good luck finding a physical copy, because that stuff is incredibly rare and very expensive. Hell, the short was even banned in Russia in 2010, but was eventually overturned in 2016. Russia was like, what's wrong? We hate the Nazis. Why don't we have this short up? Why did we ban this? After that, there's The Ductator. Created by Schlesinger Productions, which would soon be sold to Warner Brothers, this animated short was released in 1942 and satirizes the rise of the Axis powers. You got bird versions of Hitler, Mussolini, Hideki Tojo as they take over the farm but then get their asses kicked by the Dove of Peace and the American Minuteman guy from their War Bond poster. First off, Mel Blanc just had too much fun pretending to be Hitler. Just listen to the guy. Secondly, Warner has typically been better at admitting to their past mistakes compared to Disney. For example, the Ductators can be bought from a DVD collection, but you're not going to see it on HBO Max or in TV syndication. 
Warner is too afraid of the racist caricatures of the Japanese to do that. Uh, and speaking of which, now we start to really get into the yikes territory of these cartoons. I present to you all Bugs Bunny Nips the Nips. For the record, the word nips is an ethnic slur and is an abbreviation of the word nippon. It was used in the war by allied soldiers fighting in the Pacific. And I only say the word to quote the title of the actual cartoon short for educational purposes. Released in April of 1944, this cartoon features Bugs Bunny as he gets stranded on a Japanese occupied island and gets into a fight with some soldiers. Like I said, caricatures are a very common theme in these cartoons. Hitler looks scrawny and has bags under his eyes. Mussolini has that giant chin of his. But man, the Japanese get it so much worse, which isn't appropriate by today's measures, but is understandable considering the Americans hated them during the war. Bugs Bunny himself has quite the history with racist cartoons. Now, Warner was much more forward with that brand of humor compared to Mickey and Disney and this short with Bugs is no exception. There's even a part where Bugs drops a bunch of racist slurs while handing out ice cream bars. I keep saying it, but yeah, war sucks. And when your enemies are killing your friends, you typically don't care when it comes to calling them nasty names. If anything, it's encouraged. That here was the case. Warner would eventually pull the short from TV syndication, as Japanese groups from the 1990s demanded for its removal from television, and it has remained off of TV ever since. But the final short on our list is even worse, and it's probably the most unapologetically racist cartoon to come from the war, Tokyo Jokyo. Released in May of 1943 and created by Slicinger Productions, this short acts as a newsreel from Japan that was captured by American soldiers. Throughout the short, there are parts that showcase the Japanese war effort and their day-to-day -day lives. But of course, it's satirized and portrays the Japanese as weak and incompetent. Out of all the cartoons that come from the war, this one goes the hardest on the Japanese. Every single character in the entire short is a racist caricature. They even have this one part where Admiral Yamamoto says, I'm going to the White House. And then an editor's note says, quote, this will be his actual room. And it's an electrical chair. Warner was so afraid of dealing with this short that they just dumped it into the public domain. They didn't even want to attempt to explain this one. They just tossed it away and never looked back. Trust me on this one. You don't want to know. Audrey, don't tell it. You shouldn't have told me, but you did. And now I'm telling you, you don't want to know. In conclusion, these animated shorts from World War II give us insight to the human condition and culture from the 1930s and 40s. It was a completely different time and it almost feels alien to us today. There was so much that was socially acceptable from that era, but is now considered offensive and disgusting today. Hey, if anything, I take that as a sign of progress. That being said, it was war, and war is ugly. It brings out the absolute worst in people, as each side tries to dehumanize the other. And that's what happened to many animated characters around this time. It's like they were pulled away from their cartoony shenanigans and were drafted into the front lines. <laughs> now I'm getting sad thinking about Donald Duck having war flashbacks during DuckTales. All in all though, it is very important for these cartoons to exist and to be easily accessible for audiences to watch for educational purposes. Erasing the past only hurts our future and it doesn't allow us to learn from the lives of our ancestors. Also, like I said before, this is truly one of the most unique eras of animation, and we should absolutely preserve it. I mean, I severely doubt we'll see modern cartoon characters utilized in such a way ever again. And if we do, well, let's just hope that we don't. the end. 
So, so a big shout out to this video sponsor, Magic Spoon. You know, when I was first told about keto cereal, I was like, what? This is a thing? Nobody told me about this. I did keto during COVID from 2020. I did keto because I thought, what else can I do? I wanted to lose some weight. And my God, in that process, it was hard to find things that are like sweet, uh, meats and, and cheeses and lots of vegetables, but you feel strong throughout the day. You're like, yeah, I'm doing it. But then nighttime rolls around and you're like, I could really go for something sweet, but I can't, at least not traditionally sweet. Now, let me tell you, I wish with all my heart, I wish I had this during keto. It would have made a world of difference. Now, funny enough, I'm trying to get back onto keto. <laughs> and this is a big reason why. So I'm like, oh, I can do it again now. And I got my cereal. I love cereal. And this stuff tastes just like real cereal. Actually, I think it's better. So here's another fun story. I genuinely had like 16 boxes that were given to me. <laughs> I only have four left. I went through them so fast before recording this. I was actually worried where I'm like, oh shoot, did I eat too much? Just got peanut butter. You got frosted. Oh, that fruity, fruity. This is frosted. And then of course, chocolate, which is my favorite. And well, peanut butter is pretty dang. They're both really good. I think it's a tie. I'm gonna eat this cereal and tell you all some cool things about Magic Spoon, all right? Zero grams of sugar, zero. 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Also 140 calories per serving. <laughs> Did you enjoy my cereal ASMR? <laughs> it just blows my mind how good this stuff is, yet nutritious too. Like it's good for you. I gave some to some uh, friends of mine and I was like, you wanna try it out? I got boxes and they're like, yeah, I love cereal. So my friend, she was like, she enjoyed it. She gave some to her dad and her dad loved it too. And these folks don't even do keto. They're just like, hey, we like, we like cereal and they liked it too. So I feel like that's like a really good sign when folks who aren't on the keto diet eat the cereal anyway and enjoy it. It's like, oh, good. I mean, that's how I feel. 2020 me is screaming in the past. Like, why didn't you know about this? You could have, ugh, ugh. It's keto friendly. It's gluten friendly. You got the cool crossword puzzles on the back. I should probably mention that I still do the crossword puzzles. How are the, is that what they call crossword puzzles? The, um, the ones where you do the thing, the thing, the thing, you know the thing? It's keto friendly. It's gluten free. It's grain free. It's soy free. It's low carb and it's non GMO as in GMO free. So I say, Click the link down below. Go to magicspoon.com slash Saberspark. Nailed it. Uh, get a variety pack of cereal. You can do the frosted, the peanut butter, the, the chocolate, fruity. Get a variety pack. That's what I got. And try it out today. Use the promo code and you can get $5 off of any order. I, again, I mean, I mean it, folks. I really do. I, I've never done a food sponsorship, but me from 2020 doing keto, knowing the struggles of it. I was really curious to try this stuff out to see like, what did I miss? I love it. And I'm trying to get back into keto. And I think once I do get into full swing, this stuff is going to be like my right hand man. So thank you Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Guys, go check it out.